All right, welcome everyone. This is Our Travel Experiences. I'm your host, Kyle Rasmussen. And today I have with me Amy, who is the owner of Guide Guides. Amy, how are you today? I'm pretty good. How are you guys doing over there? Doing well, doing well. We were just, you know, talking before we hopped on here that uh, it's a little little cold and rainy and, and gray over here. And I think it's uh, somewhat similar over where you're at, too. Yeah, I think we're both located in places that are famous for that kind of weather. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, definitely, definitely. Um, well, I'm really excited to talk about uh, some of your travel experiences and what, it, you know, your life is like as a tour cool. uh, director and guide. Um, so it should be a fun conversation. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, uh, why don't we start out with um, just kind of share with the listeners, you know, what what is Guide Guides and how did that kind of get started? Well, like so many other things in my life, it happened by accident. <laughs> um, and I just went with it. Um, I am, well, since 2017, I've been doing it officially and in a certified manner. I am a tour guide and tour director. Um, and anybody who's in this industry recognizes the fact that it tends to be a seasonal job. And so we're always looking for ways in which we can supplement our travel addiction in our off seasons, our quote unquote off seasons. And so um, I decided to try and, and find ways that would allow me to kind of combine a business approach and, and hopefully an income approach with um, my nerdy, geeky fashion or, uh, passion for research, new destinations, new locations, new histories. And so a lot of the tours that I've been designing with guide guides come out of that. Okay. Awesome. And uh, I really like the, um, the, the virtual tours that you have. How did that yes. kind of start? Well, again, it kind of happened uh, when it was least expected. I had visited London for the very first time and I am a fanatic when it comes to ancient Roman history and the remnants of it that might still exist. And I discovered mm -hmm. during my first visit to London that not only was the city founded by the Romans, but there were still some amazing ruins left that could be seen. But we had to really hunt for them because there just didn't seem like anybody who had put together any sort of tour, whether a casual one or a formal one, that would allow me to kind of research everything all at once. So I just went right down those rabbit holes and I collected a whole bunch of information. And every time I go into the city, I'd visit another little spot until I realized that I wanted to share this with other people who are just as nerdy as I was. And I looked for different ways that I could do that. And this was pre-pandemic, so it wasn't really when people had truly come into an awareness of how virtual travel could be a, a tremendous opportunity. But mm -hmm. it was still this tiny little niche, niche idea, and I explored different platforms that would allow me to do it because I am not a tech-savvy individual. I wanted to find something that was as um, accident-supporting as possible. <laughs> Um, and yet would still be easily accessible to the general public. So I found this really cool platform that encouraged that, that really provided me with a technology. Somebody else was doing the technology. All I had to do was to sit and have this conversation and record it. And then I, I did that. I did this for the Roman wall walk, I called it in London. And I walked people along the remains of the Roman wall that actually the city of London still uses as its boundaries to this day. Um, wow. And had so much fun doing it. And that led right into the pandemic times. And I thought, ooh, now more and more people are looking at these virtual tours as something that's not just an occasional fun, but almost this need, this outlet to explore when they're stuck at home. And so I decided to start expanding on that and taking advantage of the notes that I already had for some of the places that I was familiar with. And I've started turning, I think I've got six or seven out there now. Um, and um, it's been this, this really interesting mix of feeding my own addictions and hopefully encouraging other people to develop some. Yeah, I love that. 
Uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting that you you started that before COVID. Did you see any, did, or did you see a lot of growth with the virtual tours um, during the oh, pandemic? Yes. And the irony is that, um, and I understand why, a lot of people in my community, my tour guiding community, were quite nervous about that at first because they thought, oh gosh, how in the world can a digital-based tour experience possibly compare to a live one? Nobody's going to enjoy this. And if they do, oh my gosh, we're going to be out of a job. (laughs) So there was this incredible anxiety connected to the idea, but we started realizing how it was an incredible opportunity to reach people who weren't able to meet up with us in person. Um, And that Mm -hmm. has really continued beyond the pandemic because not everyone has the time or the finances or sometimes even the courage, and that's fair, to just buy a plane ticket, hop on a train, take off to a different destination, but they still have an interest. They still have an eagerness to learn about it and to talk to somebody about it. And there's so many different versions of virtual tours now. You can do them live, you can visit them recorded, you can do audio tours, uh, video tours. Um, There's ways that you can do them as groups. We did some as a family. Um, We did some where we had the whole thing broadcast live on the television in our living room and the kids were interacting. It was one of the Harry Potter, um, visit the Harry Potter movie filming locations. And it was a tour and the tour guide was chatting with the kids the whole time and answering their questions. So it really has some phenomenal opportunity built right into it, regardless of the format but Mm -hmm. we were able to go places that we never would have been able to go um, during the pandemic. And since then I've gone to, I've gone to, I've gone through a palace in St. Petersburg. I've gone swimming with dolphins in Kenya. I mean, there's so many different things that I can do that then I learn from, but I don't necessarily have to be in there in person um, Mm -hmm. if, if I have limits for some sort of reason. Yeah, well, to me, I mean, it, it's such a great idea because it makes it so accessible for, for everyone to be able to, to travel exactly. through these places. Exactly. And what I've discovered is that there's a lot of people out there who do require a fair amount of building up of courage to take mm-hmm. on big adventures. And some of these opportunities really build that up for them. It gives them an opportunity to test the waters to experiment with something that they're really overwhelmed by the idea of. And they'll start moving closer and closer to fulfilling the dream of actually purchasing that ticket and getting on that plane or that train. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm sure too, with, you know, with some places, um, especially, you know, in the new, the new era of travel since COVID, you know, some places aren't as, as accessible. You, You know, maybe we can't actually get to them. Um, Still an issue, you know. On our status too, um, so yeah, it really opens up the world in just a new way. So I, I really love that. When I when I first went on your website, I was like, oh my gosh, this is such a great idea. Why didn't I think about it? <laughs> well, more and more people are, um, and and I'm experimenting still too. I've I've kind of dipped my toes in the audio and the video recorded. Um, virtual tours, but there's some really interesting what formats out there now that allow you to do the live stuff. Um, so I need to be a little bit more bold with that. I've I've got some anxieties that I have to overcome when it when it's when it's connected to technology. Um, so I can I can relate to that. <laughs> I can yeah. relate to nerves and how that limits us sometimes in taking on what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, does it? Does it take a lot of work to to build these guides, uh, the virtual tours and audio tours for people? It does. It's it's. Mm-hmm. Let me say that's actually my answer should be more. It's it's mixed. If okay. you are super comfortable with technology, it's not. Um, there is a bit of a hurdle when it comes to figuring out how to use even the platform that's provided to me, and because mm-hmm. I do these maybe twice or three times a year 
my memory <laughs> phase. <laughs> And I almost feel like I'm starting a new one each time. And I, I really need somebody to kind of refresh my memory when I start it up. But I would say the fun part and the easy part is coming up with the script and figuring out what I want to share with people, how I want to share it. That is super exciting. And you kind of um, build off of that. Once you've gotten the script, once you've gotten the ideas that you want to share, then you come up with, okay, the hurdle of the technology, let me get through that, but I've got this great story I wanna tell, so it's worth the pain and anxiety of the technology hurdles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. What, what's the process like to, to create a script? Well, um, for the places that I have not been guiding yet, it's a little bit more time consuming because you have to imagine what the best routes would be. Um, I do have uh, a fair amount of experience. My, my go-to city, my favorite city is Washington, D.C. That's where I got my start as a tour guide. And it's where my comfort zone is because I've done so many tours already. So I have a sense of flow of what the sequence is for the locations that I want to share based on the story I want to share, because you don't just want to tell these fragmented bits and pieces of facts or mm -hmm. random stories. When you're trying to put together an overarching narrative, that's the most fun and that's the most interesting. So you tend to look at the location, you come up with the theme that you want to share, you come up with the way in which it's not that different from writing a story. You have to have a plot, you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And mm -hmm. then you kind of overlay that on the geography where these stories are taking place. Okay. Yeah, and, and speaking of stories, uh, I, I saw that you're a, a children's book author, is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was a fun, fun random experiment as well because um, I have had over the years, I don't have children of my own, um, but I have a wildly large number of nieces, nephews, godchildren, um, friends and family that um, just I have fun with. And I've we've always gotten into a habit, these kids and I, of making up stories. And one day I thought, you know what, I'm going to just put one together for this one particular child in my life that we had shared and, and kind of created together. And again, it was kind of an experiment. I wanted to see what it would be like to self-publish and what the process was. So I just dove right into it. Uh, I found an illustrator, um, put the story together in a bit more of a structured way than just a bedtime sitting at, you know, sitting next to the kid and, and, and going back and forth. and. Um, and then found a way to do it with audio as well. And I think that was kind of my gateway into audio files and the technology of how easily it is to share those. Once, once you've got a book in your hand, it, there's, there's definitely a funness or an entertainment factor in reading in your head. But the out loud aspect of it, the hearing of the voices, the making the different characters with little kids, that's the fun part, right? Yeah. Imagine as you're talking what their voice would sound like and how they would respond to the other people. <laughs> and when I saw how wonderfully recording an audio file would then allow that to be shared over and over and over again and how that child could hear me share that story and tell that story whether I was sitting next to them giving them a bedtime story or I was on the opposite side of the ocean so that's really what got me quite excited about how the recorded voice would be perpetually telling a story instead of just occasionally in person mm -hmm. yeah that's I love that I love that so much I mean you can you can, you can be there with your family in a sense, uh, right? even though you are on the other side of the world. And that's not easy for those of us who choose lives of adventure and mm -hmm. the types of lifestyles that we we live to, to have that part of our life so alive. Mm -hmm. You have to be away from your family and friends for so long and you can come and you can go, but you're always feeling a little homesick for somebody. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that's, that's kind of how I started a lot of my, you know, travel stuff is it, just, yeah. Uh, I I'd, I'd been getting requests from, from family members of, you know, can you send updates or can you explain this place or, you know, just keep me updated on what your travels sure. are. I, yeah. I want some context on the pictures and things like that. So I was like, well, let me start talking about it and start, you know, right. making videos that put it all together and, and have, you know, me explain what I was thinking in that moment and that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's been fun to see people really enjoy, you know, kind of experience it, experiencing it along with me. Yes. Well. Yes. I think you, you hit the nail on the head right there. How, how, how shareable it becomes mm -hmm. when you make use of the technology that way. Yeah. I think it makes it easier to, to relate back with your family too. I know one of the biggest struggles I have traveling is, is coming home and kind of experiencing that re reverse culture shock and <laughs> realizing that people don't really care about the travels as much as I care about what I just experienced. Right. Right. And so it makes it easy to, to share those experiences with them so they have a little bit of an understanding. And if you can do it, like you said, with video or audio in the moment that you're experiencing it or near as, as, as near as possible to that, the excitement mm -hmm. is in your voice, the excitement is in the expression on your face. And it's easier to relay that joy when mm -hmm. they can see and hear it um, more in the moment then, you know, you come back, like you said, you come back from these trips and there's the inevitable, oh, yeah, nobody's <laughs> as excited as I am. And how do, how do I get them to understand how this yeah. has impacted me? And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I think technology has just skyrocketed in the creative ways that we can use it to, to express that so that the mm -hmm. joy is palpable. Yeah, yeah, it just it makes it so much easier now. Um, and, and I'm excited to see what happens in the future with all of that, too. Mm, it's only gonna it's only gonna get more and more creative. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how, how did you uh, become a tour guide? What made you decide to become a tour guide? <laughs> you want me to introduce another accident? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> Yet another, Another um, left turn instead of a right. Well, I had been doing the job without realizing it was the job for, for years. Um, I worked as, I started out as an educator teaching, and then I shifted over the years to administration and teaching, kind of did a, a mix. And I was doing this in international schools. And so many of them were in these great locations that allowed me to teach history hands-on. Like I was living in Egypt for most of this time and oh, wow. I could take my kids to the pyramids. They could literally touch what we were studying in the textbooks. And that's a rarity for history to make history hands-on. Mm -hmm. So I was creating a lot of these for lack of a better term, field trips, but really they became interactive learning units. And bit by bit, the kids were getting so responsive to it and it was impacting so many other areas of their learning experiences that teachers and other subjects would come up to me and say, hey, that unit that you're going to be doing in a couple months, can we find a way to build it into the math curriculum or the English curriculum? Or can I parallel a project at the same time you're doing that? Um, and so over the last couple of schools that I was working at, the very, very last one hired me specifically to build a, I guess you would call it, well, we called it school without walls. Um, it was a program that was designed to have the kids still officially be in school for that week, but yet they were required to be going out and about on trips, whether it be as local as the city that they were in or if they went internationally or something in between um, and do activities and uh, visit locations that built into what they were learning in the different classroom subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was the one who was kind of coordinating all of that, developing the programs that would amalgamate all these different aspects and working with the travel guides and the tour guides and the tour managers and the hotels and flights and, 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 and. 
Mm -hmm. So I was doing that for quite a few years. And then things got a little bit crazy in Egypt uh, for a while. They they decided to have a revolution. Mm -hmm. And over the course of a couple of years, it became more and more difficult for me to stay as as a non-Egyptian. And there's all sorts of politics that went into it. But essentially, um, eventually in 2016, I realized I had to leave. And I said, I'm going to just take a gap here. I'm going to find another place to go, another country, and I'll continue doing this educational stuff after a year's break. But in the meantime, I'm going to travel. I'm going to enjoy the things, the places that I have been teaching. I'm going to go across Europe. And so I came up on this really wild idea. I found an ancient medieval pilgrimage path that ran from London, well, Canterbury, officially, Canterbury, England, to Rome. And since 900, the year 900, people had been walking through it. It's it's similar to the idea of the Camino del Santiago that a lot of people are more familiar with, but it's much older. The Camino del Santiago kind of replaced the pilgrimage path of the Via Francigena once the Via Francigena was no longer safe to travel on. Mm -hmm. So I did that and I had so many absolutely wonderful and so many absolutely horrible experiences (laughs) during the course (laughs) of the three months that I did that. And I walked away from it saying, I can't just have travel occasionally in my life. I have to do this more regularly, I have to find a way to get more people to do this. So that's when I looked into officially turning myself into a certified tour guide and tour manager. So that's kind of the really weird, not so nutshell, sideways (laughs) manner that I got into it. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely uh, all over the place there. But (laughs) Um, I mean, it seems like it worked out okay. (laughs) Well, Uh, I think if you talk to other tour guides, other, you're rarely going to come across people who nowadays who say, um, I decided when I was young that I was going to be a tour guide and I, you know, finished high school or I finished college and I went right into it. Most of us come at it sideways. Most of us discover it as an opportunity to do somewhere along the lines and it somehow feeds other passions that we have already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what was the? I have a lot of questions from what you what you just <laughs> said. But, um, sticking with the the tour guiding for now, um, what what is the process to becoming a certified tour guide? Is there certain rules in different countries, or is it there like a universal one? Universal rules that you have to follow. There is absolutely nothing universal, um, which and and actually, um, not only is it country by country, it very often can be like for the example of the United States, state by state or even city by city. Mm-hmm. Um, the United States, it's easier to get started in an official certified manner than it is say, for example, in Europe, because the certification process is a much quicker, method. In the U.S., there's really only a handful of certification organizations, and they're usually three to four week programs. They're, they're quite manageable time-wise. And they tend to be, I, I don't want to say gateways in the sense of um, that, that, that you have to walk through them in order to get to the other side and get to the tour guiding world professionally but they're definitely gateways in the sense of they're they're showing you what's on the other side they're introducing Mm -hmm. you to what the potentials are and they give you a foundation so uh, there are in the u.s only well in in the region i i tend to stay on the east coast and even the northeast Um, And in that region that I'm familiar with, that I'm experienced with, there's only two cities that expect tour guides to be certified. Um, And that is New York and Washington, D.C. 
Um, the other uh, cities, the, you know, those are the cities that you actually have to have a license in hand. Um, technically, re it's not realistic, but technically, the authorities can walk up to anybody in those cities who is leading a group and say, show me your ID. Huh. But that is rare. Um, even in the years since I've had it, I have not had anybody other than an employer asking me to do that. Now, there's also different um, employment methods that you can use uh, or you can approach as a tour guide. You can work completely independently. You can say, you know, I live in Memphis and I love country music and I want to focus on all of the amazing things in Memphis. And so you can be a local guide. You can be someone that when anybody comes to Memphis, they seek you out and you can advertise yourself as an individual business or you can hire yourself out as an independent contractor to companies that bring guests in. So the companies are responsible for finding the guests. And once they've got a group, they contact you and say, hey, we're going to be in town on these dates. Are you available? Mm -hmm. So you can approach it that way. Um, my experience is more along the lines of, of um, working what they call over the road tours. And that's when you are hired by a company, a tour operating company. They organize the groups, they organize the itinerary, and then they bring you on to ride along with the group from city to city and kind of be the, um, well, this, this is an old fashioned term, but the den mother um, or, you know, the, the caretaker of that group as you go from place to place. Yeah. And you're not only talking about the history, you're not only telling the stories about the different characters, but you're also checking them into the hotels. You're also making sure the dinner reservations are, are, are confirmed and managing kind of the logistical aspects of things as well. And that's when you shift away from being just a tour guide and your label tends to become something like a tour director or a tour manager. Yeah, that makes sense. I've, I've been on a few of those tours where they they have someone like that. Yes. Uh, which I think is a really nice way to, to do things. It takes a lot of anxiety and worry off of the traveler. Mm -hmm, that's for sure. Uh, I'm sure it's a lot, a lot of work for the actual tour director themselves. I know that's you're in charge of so many people, but... <laughs> it um, is, but we do it because we like it, right? We mm -hmm. do it because you get all the good stuff as well as the frustrating stuff and the good stuff tends to outweigh the, the tedious. Yeah. Uh, do you, um, uh, is there a place where you can seek out these companies that are looking for these tour directors or guides or do they just come to you? There is no one database. Wouldn't that be lovely if there was? Yeah. <laughs> um, this is where the certification programs really come in. Or um, even just in the short amount of time that I've been doing this, there have been a handful of not just certification programs, but what they call destination training companies, <coughs> excuse me, that have popped up where when you sign up to be a part of them, they introduce you to these companies, whether it be formally through conferences that they arrange kind of like a mixture of a job fair and um a travel geek uh, conference or whether it be um i know some of them they actually have again since since covid a lot of online virtual meetings where a lot of these companies will will come to one of these meetings to present who they are, to introduce where their destinations are, the type of jobs that they are hiring for. And then mm -hmm. you meet them virtually and you send in your resume if you're interested. It's like a vetting process of sorts. Mm -hmm. But so much of this industry really is word of mouth and really is getting to know the personalities, um, and working for one company, getting a good reputation amongst them, and then working for another company and having them be, be referencing one another. Um, some of the friends of mine that I went through the certification program with, we, we, we were a class of, I think, 25. 
There are now six of us remaining who are still actively working in the career, but we are all working in different companies. And at the same time, we overlap now and then because they'll, they'll say, Hey, you know, I've been working with this company. It's really great. They've got an opening for Boston. Would you be interested? And if so, I'll recommend you. So it, it's really a very cool network of, of other people who are doing the job, who know who you are, know what your, what your focus is, what your, your work style is. And then kind of, it's almost like, like dating, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, if your friend says, Oh, I know this really great person yeah. that you'd be, a, you know, you have great conversations. You love doing the same things. These tour companies really have personalities as well. Mm-hmm. Some of them are massive industrial style, you know, pushing out these tour groups one by one by one by one by one. Um, and then there's others that are very small, very slow paced, um, have a focus on history or have a focus on religion or have a focus on food or and you can personalize your connection with them. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it is word of mouth and a lot of it is it comes down to what your style of working is and what your interest level is in different regions. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's, that's really cool. I, I, it is. I don't, I didn't know much about, uh, you know, how that kind of process works um, before you just, you just mentioned it there. So I don't know yeah. that, that definitely gets the wheels spinning in my head of like, Oh, this, this might be something that that sounds interesting to me. And you can definitely, it sounds like you can find, you know, something that's going to fit for you specifically. And there's a lot of different options out there. There really are. So I don't want to say easy, but it is so natural to find a niche, to find your, Mm -hmm. your place, whether it's a a geographical region, whether it's a theme, whether it's um, a demographic that you like talking to, if you like talking to senior citizens, or if you like kids. There's, there's something out there for absolutely anyone who loves sharing. Yeah, I love that. I'm definitely going to have to follow up with you more after uh, we're done talking here. No problem at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> Got lots I'll, of ideas to share. Yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, uh, so I want to go back to, uh, you mentioned you, um, you, you did the, you followed the pilgrimage path. Um, what was the name of it again? It's called the Via Francigena. Okay. So I, it, my first thought was, you said it started in Canterbury, England and ended in Rome. Yes. Um, how did that pilgrimage work with the English Channel in the way? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's kind of a planes, trains and automobile kind of a thing, minus okay. the planes. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, if you go, go to the true historic manner, it's minus the trains as well and automobiles. But mm-hmm. you basically get from point A to point B following that route. And, and, and if you do it like as a purist, you have to do it on foot. But mm-hmm. here's the thing. Its basis is from history, of course, and a time period in history when the pilgrims had no option other than maybe a donkey cart. They had mm-hmm. to go by foot. Um, horseback was something that was reserved for the people who were really well off, but most pilgrims would do it, um, over the course of that, that length to walk from the, between those two places. And if you did it every single day for the full day, it takes about three months. That is not something that's short. Mm -hmm. Um, Nowadays, you have a set historic path, but you can choose how personalized you want to make it. Um, You can decide to stop off, which I did on a couple of occasions, take little detours and visit other places that are slightly off the beaten path. Um, I was mostly interested in a particular section of that path and so I wanted to get through some of the other ones a little faster (laughs) so (laughs) I said well I hear France is kind of flat before you get to the Alps I'll just ride a bike 
through the French portions and I'll get to the mountains. I'll, I'll ditch the bike and I'll start by foot from there. And that'll give me more time to explore Italy. That was my whole, my whole excitement. Well, as, as these types of things do happen, um, nothing went according to plan. Um, to get from Canterbury to what they, what they use as the, the typical path is Calais on the French coast. Okay. There is a ferry now. And the idea was to take, I took the bicycle on the ferry and started riding once I got over to the French side. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you've got to do a little bit more research into it because that ferry that runs between those two ports has been going back and forth as to whether or not it would allow pedestrians uh, uh, or people with bicycles. It used to be you could just walk right onto those ferries. Now they're saying you have to have an automobile. So um, they've gone back and forth on that. It's not as straightforward as just going down to the port and catching a boat. You do have to do some due diligence research. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So how long did it end up uh, taking you? Well, I didn't have an alternative to the three-month limit because as an American, the visa that you are visiting Europe on is something called a Schengen. Well, you're in the Schengen zone. And you have 90 days tops uh, before you have to leave the Schengen zone countries. And once those 90 days are up, you have to wait another chunk of time before you can come back. So I managed to do it in spite of a whole bunch of weird injuries and odd uh, encounters, <laughs> some involving hedgehogs um, and sick nuns. There were, I think I, I think it was like a day or two below my 90 days wow. that it took me to get where I wanted to go. Um, and I was quite creative in how I got through that path over the course of 90 days. Um, and I did have to skip some segments, which I then went back um, the following chunk of time that the Schengen allowed me in. And I, I redid them. I redid the ones that I missed. So um, it's not something for the faint of heart. You really do need to commit to a trek like that. Although, that being said, there's quite a few people who do it in segments. So they might have a two-week holiday and they'll do a certain stretch. Then the following year, when they have their next two-week holiday, they'll pick up where they left off and continue till they get as far as they get. So mm -hmm. you can do it in, in pieces like that as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that's kind of similar with the um, uh, the Camino de Real. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and same thing with, the, you know, the I, I would think of the Pacific Crest Trail, the Appalachian Trail here in, in mm -hmm. the U.S. too. And much like I was referencing with the tour companies having so many different unique personalities, it's like that with hiking trails, isn't it? Yeah. It's like that with paths that you choose. The Camino is such a communal experience. It is, it is a draw for people because of that, because they're able to meet people along the way. They're able to um, stay in hostels where other travelers are. There's a sense of safety. Mm -hmm. um, numbers as well. Whereas the Via Francigena that I went on in the entire three months, I didn't come across another pilgrim that was walking it or trekking it. And so you've got those two extremes um, with those two paths that I just mentioned. And there's something in between for everybody. You can find somewhere, you know, some people are on there, some people aren't. You've got to sort out what type of experience you want to have mm -hmm. and then find the path. So I knew for a variety of reasons that I needed a solo experience. I needed to do this by myself and for myself. And so I chose the path that was less trod both, both in poetic sense as well as realistic sense. Mm -hmm. Did you feel, um, you know, talking about safety, did you feel safe uh, along the path? 99.9% .9 of the time, yes. 
Um, there were a few examples where the safe, the unsafeness that I felt was less an actual worry of physical harm and more of a comfort zone, getting out of my comfort zone kind of fear. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of that, I'd have to say. But then every now and again, you have to wonder if, because I was using GPS and, and tracking and it didn't always work in some of the more remote areas. And so uh, my reliance on the technology sometimes bit me on the bite on the backside because I followed a wrong road or um, all of a sudden I'm faced with a fence that the, the path says I'm supposed to cross, but there's a very angry looking dog on the other side kind of a deal. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's those types of issues, but having my phone with me or whatever device I would be carrying um, gave me a sense of comfort because I knew I could always either communicate if I was in an urgent need for help um, or if I was lonely, you know, there's, there's that factor as well. You do this or I did this anyways to be a solo traveler, to have that alone time. But every once in a while, it can get really overwhelming. And yeah. the opportunity to call someone or to send somebody a message or even just to look something up uh, online in an easy way um, mm -hmm. was a comfort as well. And, and that, for me, was mitigating some of the concerns I had for safety. It made me feel like I had a close connection to a comfort blanket of sorts or a security <coughs> support in the immediate vicinity for the most part. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's nice. Um, you, you could still still do it alone, but you had, you had options if you needed it. Yep. Exactly. I could be as alone as I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I, can, I, I think that's the best way of saying it. Yeah. I like, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That, I mean, that sounds amazing. And uh, now I'm going, I'm writing this down saying, Oh, now I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have, my list well, just keeps getting longer. It never gets shorter. No, no matter how right? much. I travel. <laughs> right. Right. Well, any, you, yourself, and anybody who's listening to this who has any questions about this, who wants to chat through some of the problem-solving aspects of approaching a, a task like this, please feel comfortable approaching me about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. I, I always encourage people to to reach out to, to all my all my guests on here. I mean, I really want this Excellent. to be a community. And I, and I, love, I love the travel community because everyone is so welcoming and open a lot of times. It's just, it's a fun group to be a part of. We're a dysfunctional family, but we're a family nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I know um, you worked as, as an archeologist as well. What was that? Ah, like? yes. Ah, <laughs> yes. Um, that was actually how I first uh, traveled internationally. That was my okay. first experience going overseas. Um, I had, I was studying in college, I was studying history and I started really leaning in the direction of ancient history. Mm -hmm. And one of my professors um, pulled me aside one day and said, look, if this is something that really interests you, you need to figure out right now <laughs> if you're gonna, if you're gonna wanna be a dirt digger, if you're gonna want to do something like that for your, for your life, for your career. And if that's the case, I can find you a really interesting scholarship. So I said, sign me up. Um, and I went over um, a lot of these excavations, recruit people to come and do the manual labor of the digging with this very romantic notion of volunteering. Uh, you know, they'll have They'll have their academic staff and their managers in the field, but then they'll say, we, we need somebody to actually move the wheelbarrows, to lift the shovels, to, you know, to do the sifting. And so they'll go out there and they'll look for all these quote unquote volunteers, but you really do have to pay for that experience. It's not like um, 
they bring you over on this great flight and they take care of you the entire time. You, you pay your way on most of these. Um, but that's how I started. I started out as a history lover with um, more than surface knowledge, but still very book knowledge of what excavating was going to be like. And I got over there and I actually put my hands in the sand, in the dirt, and that was it. <laughs> I was hooked. And I went back year after year and I eventually was brought on staff. So um, it shifted from me paying them to them paying me. Although, again, it's it's not something you really become rich off of. Um, I think the first year that I did it, that I was paid for two months, I got the equivalent of about six hundred dollars. So, wow. <laughs> but they fed me. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, <fine. laughs> so that was something. But um, but it was over in in Israel, in a, a city called Ashkelon, uh, that I first got my 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 nails dirty. And I inhaled, I, I sniffed deeply of that sand. And, um, you know, they say if you dip your toes in the Nile or if you flip a coin in the Trevi Fountain, you're, you're guaranteed to return. It's, it's kind of the same when you lift a spade of dirt and you discover that you are touching something that hasn't seen the light of day for three, four, 5,000 years. And mm -hmm. you're a part of that discovery process. And... <laughs> Holy cow! Is the adrenaline surge? See, that's that is a great sales pitch to become an archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not as you know as as adrenaline surging as as Indiana Jones makes it look like, but it's pretty darn close. Yeah, that honestly, after you you just said that, I'm like, wow, an archaeologist. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> oh man. I'm throwing you all kinds of career opportunities I here, kids, aren't I? Uh, I, I love then you it. Rode all the way and walk a trek, you know, for a couple months as well. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you did you have any uh, really exciting discoveries when you were there? Well, yes, but I'm not sure if it's as exciting for other people as it is for me. <laughs> but. Um, I found some human remains. Um, I found some gold. I found some, and, and Israel wasn't the only place. I ended up um, years later excavating over in Egypt as well, right at the base of the pyramids. Most of the sites that I was working on were not, in spite of the, the fact that I mentioned I found a piece of gold once, they were not these places of palaces. They were not you know, the grand architecture of the temples. They tended to be the regular people's homes, the, the market areas, the, 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 the kinds of buildings that the exciting stuff that you're finding are pottery jugs full of seeds that were burnt in a fire. Um, and as a result of them being burnt, they're carbonized. Um, and so they last for thousands of years. Um, one of the layers that I was excavating at in Ashkelon was the layer that is mentioned in the Bible. There's a, there's a, a king called Nebuchadnezzar who kind of came down through the Levant countries and just ransacked everything, um, burnt the towns. Um, knocked the, the, the structures down and left a trail of mad, crazy reconstruction being necessary. But what people would do in ancient times, they didn't have land movers or bulldozers. They would literally just flatten everything down and build on top of it again. So the archaeologists, when we're coming down and we're slowly peeling these layers, we came across this town's entire destruction layer. Um, and that was pretty phenomenal to be able to say, wow, not only do we see this amazing stuff in front of us, but we have texts, historical texts that tell us when this happened. We knew the date mm -hmm. and the year and the month that this took place. So that was pretty cool, too. Yeah, that that sounds so cool. What a what a cool thing to be a part of. 
Yeah. And then one of the excavations over in, in Egypt that I worked on was the village that the workers who were building the pyramid were living in. So I was coming across their meal pits, I, you know, their garbage pits. I was coming across um, the rooms that they slept in. Um, another site that I worked on was the area where the very last pyramid that was ever constructed in Egypt was built. And oh, <laughs> I had forgotten about this till this very moment. We actually found a modern, relatively modern murder victim. Um alongside the wow. pyramid that we were, the base of the pyramid that we were excavating. We thought, we thought that um, it was going to be an ancient uh, human remains and come to find out it was somebody that he had had, um, had died and just kind of sat down. And because we were in the desert, the sands just buried them and they were mummified. And it ended up being somebody we dated it to about 200 years ago. Um, wow. And, and we discovered them. We found, the, we came across their toes first. Their toes popped up out of the sand. And yeah, it was it was like somebody who was, bare, you know, you go bury your friends in the sand on the beach. That's exactly what it looked like at first. <laughs> That's so crazy. What a, <laughs> what a discovery. <laughs> it was, it was, again, one of those really random accidental situations that just seemed to happen to me. Yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of those sorts of accidents that happen when you travel. I feel like a lot of it's happened to me personally, too. <laughs> if we're lucky, honestly, because I, I truly believe and my experience has been that the more you plan and you expect one thing, your your preconceived ideas can get in the way. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to the point now that when I do my own personal travel, I actually build in time to my schedule to go randomly get lost and to wander mm -hmm. and try and be surprised as opposed to planned. And some of my best memories are connected to those types of experiences that just came out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's where the real, the real adventure begins. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess on that note, with between tour guiding um, and your own personal travel, how do you make all of that work from a schedule standpoint? <laughs> Not easily. <laughs> Not easily, I have to admit. Okay. It, it's been a challenge. It really has because on the one hand, you want to make money, you want to earn money, and you want to do it doing the thing that you love. Um but then how do you then balance that with having a home? Um, if you want to have pets or plants, even as simple as that sounds, uh, or having a love life, having a family. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, I'm still in the process of juggling that. Um, I've been trying to for the last, well, minus the pandemic, you know, since 2017, and I can't say I'm completely good at it, but the seasonal nature of the job gives you a little bit more flexibility, well, a lot more flexibility than a nine to fiver. And the mm -hmm. fact that I have chosen to be an independent contractor throws a bit of a wrench into it because I am reliant on people offering me the opportunity to lead a group as opposed to actively marketing myself and recruiting guests to something I offer in my hometown. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of factors that make it not easy. But that having been said, I have a calendar that I fill. And if I want to block off a week to do my own thing, I'll do it. Um, my, my partner, his, my sweetheart, he has some children that I've gotten very close to over the last few years. And when they have a school play or if they have a holiday that I want to participate in, I block that off. And that's mm -hmm. considered my sacred personal time. I don't, I don't take any work during those blocks of time. Um, I also know going into building my year schedule that the springtime is crazy busy and I've got to grab as much work as I can then because the winter time 
is almost empty and the opportunities for jobs are minimal. And so there's a certain aspect of grab it while you can. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm still figuring it out. It's, it's a juggling act. It is not something that is that comes naturally to everybody. And it certainly doesn't come naturally to me, but I'm working on it. Yeah, I, I feel like that's, you just got to experience it and, you know, a little bit of trial and error to, to figure awesome. it out. <laughs> a whole lot of error. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and, and then, you know, life situations change too. As, as things change in your own lives, you know, you got to adjust with that as well. Constantly. When I started this, this career path, I was single. Um, and now I've got a life partner. So finding a way to dedicate the time necessary for that is important as well. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like, um, you know, as you're traveling around and, in you know, dating, um, while you're traveling, how, what was that, um, experience for you? When I, I first started it out, um, looking at it as an adventure. Um, I was newly single at the time when I took that gap year that I was referencing mm -hmm. uh, earlier. And I signed up. I knew the path I was going to take. I knew I was walking well, the, 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 this particular path and what the cities basically were that I was going to be on. And I had a rough idea of my timeline. So I signed up for as many online platforms, <laughs> dating platforms as I could. Um, and I just kind of used it as a bit of a cultural learning experience. So I'd, you know, I knew I'd be in Paris two weeks ahead of time and I'd try and find some people who were going to be there at the same time as me on the website. And I'd say, Hey, do you want to meet for a coffee in front of Notre Dame? Or do you want to show me um, the best pastry shop that you enjoy, you know, having a croissant at or something like that, something along those lines. And so I, I kind of built it in to my scheduling and it was so much fun. I met some crazy interesting people um, and there was absolutely no pressure the way I was doing it, which was perfect for me because, you know, online dating can be a little bit intimidating. Um, mm -hmm. But it really felt like I was just meeting some great local people, um, having some wine or some coffee or some beer or whatever, and, and sitting next to a great river and hearing what it's like to live in that city. So it was kind of like mini tours. I didn't even yeah. have to consider them as dates so much, but... <clears throat> Um, and it worked out great for me considering, considering where I was in life at the time, I wasn't looking for something serious. I wasn't looking for something that would last more than a cup of coffee or so. Um, mm -hmm. I just really wanted to start talking with more people and having these interesting conversations with new faces. Yeah. I, that's one of my favorite parts of travel is just, just meeting people from the place that you're in or meet fellow travelers hostels are great for that aren't they mm -hmm. oh you know? even even if i i mean in granted hostels and it have become a little bit pricier than they, they used to be yeah. but still you know even if i could afford a more expensive hotel sometimes i just want that community that the hostel provides and the opportunity to be able to you know, walk down to breakfast and ask somebody where they're going to adventure today in London. Yeah. Or, you know, hear somebody else's story about where they went last night. And, you know, I, I, I love hostels for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I've had so many good experiences from staying in hostels and, and met people from all over the world. And it's just, I don't know, it, a lot of experiences that would have never happened had I just stayed in a you know normal ho hotel. Exactly. Exactly. Think of the things you would have missed. Mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> um, well, Amy, uh, we talked about a lot of things today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been fun. Uh, it's been a great conversation. I've I've enjoyed hearing your story. Oh, you. Really, yeah. story for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it sounds like your life has been a ton of fun. Um, 
and I'm, I'm definitely jealous of all the things that you've gotten to do, but um, it's been inspiring for me to, uh, to pursue, you know, my passions of travel more as well. So I hope that translate translates over to the listeners as well. Well, I hope so too, because, you know, jealousy is only satisfying if it inspires somebody to do something about it. Right. Um, oh. You know, if you say, well, I'm so jealous of your lifestyle. Well, yeah, that that's, that's okay. But what you can do this there's there's mm-hmm. whether it's whether it's literally doing the same things or even just adding adventure to your life in your own neighborhood um my most recent series of of instagram posts were really about that i i did a whole month of just you know what you don't have to buy that plane ticket i was i was in a strange way i was reminiscing about what I missed about the lockdowns. Um, I know that sounds odd to say, but there was an element during those times of our life lives that were, that were so simple, that were so straightforward where you could find adventure because you had to in -hmm. your own cupboards, in your own, you know, the shadows on the wall that the, (laughs) that the cobwebs were casting, or, you know, that the little bit of frozen ice on the back of the refrigerator that just catches the light and has a little rainbow in it. There were things that you were seeking out during the pandemic, during the lockdowns, because you had to, but you don't have to anymore, but just because you don't have to doesn't mean they, they disappear. There is so much you can expand in your, your home, in your neighborhood, in your town to add adventure, to add exploring into your life. So rather than just say, oh my gosh, I'm so jealous, or I wish I could, or um, I wish I was capable of, you can, and it doesn't Mm -hmm. require you to go on an archeological excavation. Sometimes it's just opening your eyes differently when you're walking to the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and really, uh, just to add on to that, I mean, with with travel, um, I think it helps you help you s- see those things in a different light. Oh, I hope I so. I really hope so. That's the best thing about it. Yeah, yeah. I know for me, every every time I travel and then I come back home, I, I notice something different or I see something right? differently. Right. Yeah, it's just I don't know. It's it's hard to explain without actually experiencing it. It's like a different set of glasses that you're wearing now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same um, stuff, but you're seeing it differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you, and you've had those those experiences that help you help you kind of think through it in a different way too. Exactly. It's like learning a new language. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I love it. Uh, uh, this has been such an awesome conversation. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I did too. Yeah, I, I'm glad to hear that as well. Um, well, I guess, um, you know, I probably should wrap it up here, but any last, uh, comments, um, or anything else that you want to share? Yes. First of all, I want anyone who has any questions about anything we discussed to feel very comfortable reaching out if they want to continue or start and continue a conversation. Um, I want to make it very clear that I'm open to encouraging conversation. So that's the first thing. Um, But secondly, yes, you don't have to have this massive adventure in front of you that looks like a life altering one of a once in a lifetime type of trip. You can find ways to add adventure and exploring to your life without even leaving home whether it's a virtual tour, whether, you know, I'm not saying that to plug it <laughs> per se, but, but the idea that it's all perception, it's all perspective, what you count as adventure. And we learned deeply and resentfully to a certain extent during those years of the pandemic that we could look at things differently, that, that it wasn't just because we had to, but that it was possible to do um, and enjoy it. So I'd, I'd want people to also look at exploring an adventure as not something that has to be grand. Um, that the small things can become grand um, without even without even needing to to leave home. So yeah, that's awesome. I think that's a that's a good way to to wrap it up here. Um, really quick, I will have you uh, you plug your stuff. Where where can uh, people find you and reach out to you at? 
Ah, well, my website is tourguideguys.com. And on Instagram, I can be found at Tuesday at 2. Um, and we can kind of go from there. We can connect on those on those platforms. Yeah, perfect. And I'll uh, when I when we post this, I'll make sure to tag you in it so people can find you easily, too. But oh, terrific. Um, yeah, again, Amy, thank you so much. It's been such a fun conversation. Sure, thanks, Kyle. Yeah, really, really doing it again soon. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, well, I look forward to, to seeing you somewhere around the world soon, and, and I really hope uh, we can connect again soon as well. Probably in one of those hostels. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amy, have a good one. All right, Kyle, thank you. Thanks, and bye. Bye. Hey everybody, Kyle here. If you enjoyed today's show and want more, you can always check out every episode on Spotify, Anchor, YouTube, and now Amazon Music as well. Just search for Our Travel Experiences on any of those platforms and it will pop up. You can also find everything all in one place on my website, OurTravelExp.com. And if you want to see my travel pictures as well as travel pictures from guests on the show, you can check them out on Instagram. The page is called Our Travel Experiences Podcast. And if you want to share your own pictures on the Instagram page or be a guest on the podcast, you can message me via that Instagram page or email me at OurTravelExperiences at Outlook.com. I would love to see your pictures and hear about your travel experiences, so please send them my way. And if that isn't enough for you, make sure to check out my weekly YouTube show from Around the World Fridays. Every Friday, I'm taking five to 10 minutes to answer questions from listeners, share some souvenirs that I bought over the years, um, share my postcards over the years that I've accumulated, or share videos and pictures from one particular city or country that I visited, and so much more. So check it out, guys. You won't be disappointed. And uh, make sure you go subscribe to that as well. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you somewhere around the world soon.